an American openness. That spirit of adventure, taking chances and of openness, is something that has really fueled the creative process of composers in America. And I think it's rhythm. How that rhythm moves in time. That, that I, coming to understand, is distinctly American. And America, with all of its unthinkable vulgarity, is the most interesting country in the world today. The experience should be deep. It should be worth listening to. You should, should be able to devote your full attention to it. All music that I think has a worth is about conveying emotional states, or at least attempting to. American music is this large sponge that's just bringing in influences from all over the world. Spontaneous. Smart. Revolutionary, but easy. all one big strand of sound which changes his character a bit by bit here and there and it's like, like a river that keeps moving in different ways. Composers, we write music we heard in our head. A lot of intuition, a lot of groping, a lot of sketching. moment of musical explosion. It's sound, you know, it's sound. And that sound is organized to create some sort of emotion. This been a tremendous time to be working. And it's all music. I don't know uh, really what's going on. I don't think anyone does. I compose at the piano if I'm doing something harmonic. But if I'm doing something textural that has to just do with, for example, a cluster of strings slowly moving downward, the piano can't help me at all on that. And it, I find it best to lie down and put a pillow over my head, seriously, and block out the world and just imagine things and do it that way. So I go back and forth, depending on our needs. I might say Stravinsky said he got some of his best uh, sounds and sonorities from his bad piano playing, that he would put his hands down and hit something and then be fascinated by what he hit. So sometimes... It, <laughs> Yeah, and, Bar and Bartok did a lot of that, getting his hands to make the music. Well, the process is so different for each composer, uh, because I don't play any instrument. I can't really use the piano or, or any other uh, means to work out my ideas actually in sound. So I'm forced to hear them in my head. I work in my head as I always have, in full orchestra, if it's an orchestra piece. It's never been a linear or field-by-field -field process for me. Okay, I know the notes that I'm going to be working with. I don't know how I'm going to put them together. I don't know the melodic material that's going to come out of that. But I, I know the, the basic uh, character of those harmonies, which has a lot to do with the piece. Normally, what I have is a very broad outline of what I'm going to do which I refine by passing through the, the total structure many times. Each time I do, it becomes more detailed and more concrete. At the beginning, it's very abstract in general. You do have to know how to get the notes on paper and push notes around, make phrases, uh, make form. Unlike an architect who can take a commission 
and sort of see the big picture and then bring in his staff and say, well, you do the wiring and you do the drainage and you do the superstructure and you do the roof. Um, we can't do that. We can't say, okay, well, you do the oboes and you take care of the counterpoint and, uh, you know, you do the Xeroxing or something like that. We, you know, we have to do it all ourselves. Every time you do a new piece, you can approach it a completely different way. And it will be a different piece, but it'll still have your signature on it because personal style is actually like your handwriting. It's something you don't think about. 348, 349, the pizzas in the violins and the cellos make them really sforzandos each time that happens, okay? Just really... Rum, bum. Personal style is something I think every good composer needs to develop. Uh, but it will find you. You won't find for it. For that whole passage. Oh. And clarinets, if you could just begin the whole thing fortissimo. Okay. It doesn't really matter what style it's written in. If the music is very telling and very strong and very imaginative. It's not a question of style. It's a question of a voice that's powerful. <laughs> No, I'm basically an intuitive composer, which I've learned to appreciate more and more as time goes on. The intuitions are what guide your, your choices. You have to pay attention to them. You have to pay really a lot of attention, and then you have to be very careful that the piece that's being intuitively built is, has a shape to it. I think music is uh, designed to project something. It has power to project emotions and uh, psychological states, subtle feelings that may be difficult to describe in linguistic terms even. Uh, I suspect it's more intuitive than it is cerebral. Each composer has to decide for him or herself which elements to take from all of these choices that are out there. There is no longer a, a shared musical language that we all speak. There's no one way. And you see so many people with so many viewpoints and so many different ways of speaking. And then you find your way by picking and choosing subconsciously and consciously what you want to reflect in your own work. One has to write the music that is inside of one, that, that, that matters to, to you, and miraculously that, that is communicated. What do you call American music? The fact is there is so much variety, and each different styles has produced some very good works. Whether it's traditional, melodic, tonal, atonal, avant-garde, serial, electronic, experimental, all of that is flourishing in an environment that encourages great openness. You will see it's so diverse, and we never had this kind of diverse phenomenon before. Tendon or Chen Yi or 
impression almost the Chinese composers. What, what do you say? You say they're Chinese music, they're not Chinese music. Actually, uh, to me, they're American music. Because the, this country, this American culture also influenced them. And, and on the other hand, American composer grew up in America, like Philip Glass, Terry Riley, or Lou Harrison. And they use a lot of East instrument or East sort of philosophy, or they or studied in the East country. I think that's the make American music very unique. The interest in world music, different ethnic sort of sounds, is, is very prevalent. Um, I think Chinese music is a, is a very wonderful example of that. But the diversity of sounds you have now in, in modern music is, is pretty extraordinary. If I have never seen the jazz crops, people, bands um, playing, singing. If I have never seen the African drumming, I wouldn't have written so many pieces like what I do today in this style. To be influenced, to, to allow yourself to be influenced by someone else is, is, a, is a beautiful thing. To, to not think that you have to recreate the, the universe in, in every piece. It's not a question of influence. As I often said, what, is, what people say, what is, what is creation? We all steal. An artist knows that he's stealing. Therefore, he says, I'm stealing, I'm just stealing this. What I must do is disguise the fact that I've stolen this property. The act of disguise is the act of art. What I like about it, and also I think that the young people should appreciate, it, is the concept of making new work and to, to make something different and to break the tradition and to try something new. And so somehow this is a new life experience. And in, you know, in, in every day's life, we always try to have something different. <laughs> play the same familiar music because, um, you know, your general average level of listener may know Beethoven's fifth, but um, is going to be wary of hearing Carliano's symphony. Although it's satisfying and wonderful to hear the same pieces interpreted with nuances by different performers, that has to be complemented in a healthy way with new pieces that challenge you because you don't know what that's about for the art form to be healthy. There will always be that closed-minded segment of the audience that will see that a piece was written after 1900 and just immediately decide that they will hate it. They shut down, they don't listen. It's home, it's familiar. You know, and they don't want, there's, please don't rock my boat or, you know, have me listen to anything that isn't that. If it's not that, it isn't music. <laughs> Modern music and audiences is, is, has been an ongoing problem for really not just the last hundred years. We would like to say that it's really a 20th century problem. It begins in the 19th century uh, with some wonderful composers, composers I just adore, like Wagner. But Wagner already is composing a music that is increasingly difficult for the quote-unquote average music lover to really comprehend. So much happened in the first part of the 20th century, uh, which has been somewhat glibly uh, reduced to Schoenberg versus Stravinsky. The Schoenberg orchestral variations, I remember when they were first played and many people hated them, Others were intrigued by just the sound, and it did. I mean, it's bound to create 
in that sense sounds about great intervallic relationships, therefore pitch relationships, which were new and could attract you and invite you into more of the music. The surfaces were sometimes very striking. But I've never been very enthusiastic about the Schoenberg of the 12-note music, most of it. I like what he did before that, and I like the very last few works that he wrote, but in between, it seems to me, it's just Brahms with wrong notes. <laughs> When I was a young child, I had a friend who uh, said to me, I want you to come over to my house, I want you to listen to something, I think you'll be surprised. Uh, you know, I thought, oh. okay. So he played me uh, The Rite of Spring. This is at the age of 14. And I remember looking out the window, we lived near a little brook, and it was just like, I don't know, the world looked different. It was just, it was, it was like somebody had opened a door and said, now, this is a room you haven't seen. <laughs> Everything Stravinsky did had to be acknowledged or supported or challenged because everyone knew there was a giant who walked the planet. Everyone knew this was really great music. You had to pay attention to it. Contemporary music this is not a... It's not as obscure as, you, as people make it out to be, I don't think. In many ways, for instance, The Rite of Spring is more li one of the most lively pieces I've ever written. It's full of life and violence and strength. And it didn't become a recognized piece in concert halls until Walt Disney put it on a film. You saw volcanoes, and then everybody understood what it was about. Everybody is influenced. Nothing comes from nothing. Every, I mean, Ives was influenced. He just took all these influences and threw them together so they become one great big soup. Well, I encountered Charles Ives, and I remember spending a Sunday afternoon with him, and we talked about Stravinsky, and he didn't like Stravinsky because there was too much repetition. And he said that it's all right to write that dissonant, but you shouldn't repeat that way. Ives makes his point in a way through overstatement. He throws everything in except the kitchen sink, and it either works or it doesn't. And when it does work, there's nothing quite like it. was a capital record called Full Dimensional Sound, sample record, uh, to show their new wonderful sound. And one of the cuts was the gunfight scene for Billy the Kid. Now, I didn't know Copeland's music. I was just a high school kid. And uh, I put it on, and of course, the bass drum was my thrill and my joy as the neighbors, you know, pounded. And I was listening to this boom, boom, ta da 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 business. You know, and then I got really curious, and I went and got the score out. And then I went real curious, and I bought a bunch more of Copeland and Stravinsky and Bernstein and various American composers I liked. And all of a sudden, my, this whole world opened up to me. And uh, I thought, this is the music I really love, and I'd love to write it. And that's, that's how it started. The function of art is not to communicate one's personal ideas or feelings, but rather to imitate nature in her manner of operation. John Cage, for me, was his biggest contribution was giving people the permission to do whatever they felt was necessary to create the music and not to be confined by the conventional thoughts about what music could be. The idea of chance operations that Cage brought in, it's, for me, is, very, is still very important, although I don't compose that way. But I feel that what it means is that to be accepting that things happen by chance, no matter what you're doing. Whether one spoke about Milton Babbitt, Elliot Carter, 
or a Boulez or a Stockhausen from Europe or a John Cage, any of the people, all very different and often opposed to each other in one way or another, they all shared uh, an interest in remaking music all the time. Each new piece was somehow supposed to be something that had never been done before. The only thing we used to encounter really was people who hated modern music. And there was no difference, it was modern music. Uh, you know that, for example, there's a very famous art historian, Mr. Gombrich, who once said that he would never attend a concert with the contemporary work on the program. Modern music is intimidating to people who don't hear a lot of it. And um, my advice would be just sit back and enjoy it and let your attention be grabbed by anything. I think that one of the things that people have desperately missed in 20th century classical music is pleasure. And, you know, this lack of pleasure or the loss of pleasure really does start with atonality and it starts with those pieces of, of Schoenberg. <laughs> After World War II, these young composers thought they needed to create this new kind of music to get away from the emotionalism that had led to the horrors of the war. And the whole thought of, of the 12-tone process is that the chromaticism, all that stuff that was happening more and more in, in the romantic late 19th century, was finally enough and had reached a dead end. And the breakthrough was the system in which tonality could be avoided. There was a period of time, for sure, that one was confined to 12-tone or serial music, and a lot of the inner, innate melodic sense of composers was stifled. The point of 12-tone music was to make all other music irrelevant. Younger composers who were interested in doing other kinds of things were shut out from that world, from the funders, the performers, the venues. They had to create their own institutions. The fact that uh, music is, has reached, or did reach, a level of complexity which was unfathomable to many listeners was part of the problem. You know, Boulez wrote all these inflammatory articles about how um, anyone who was not writing 12-tone music was irrelevant, that only young people could participate in the music of the future because old people were tainted by this old kind of thinking. That reached uh, the point of what came to be called the international style, uh, or total serialism, uh, the idea that every aspect of music could be controlled uh, by mathematical operations. I never think of, you know, I would never think of taking a mathematical formula or a mathematical expression and translating it into musical notation. It's done, I know, but I would never think of it. The 12 tone system was sitting there for me that I characterized it in certain generalities. Certainly was not my invention, certainly not anything like. Uh, the things that Schoenberg did were remarkable for a man who couldn't count up to 12 without taking off a shoe. And uh, I simply characterized certain aspects of what he was doing and generalized them by using a generalized kind of notation which looked mathematical to most people. As mathematics, it's infantile. It's congruent arithmetic and stuff they were teaching kids with the new math at the age of six. The fact of the matter is that if mathematics was suggestive, so be it. But I never think of my music as being mathematical or mathematically generated in any sense of the word. <laughs> Many listeners felt just unable to follow the composers. They, they couldn't understand what was happening intellectually in the music. They didn't feel that it, it spoke to them on an emotional level. And so increasingly composers withdrew into academia. A more academic approach to music developed, uh, you know, let's say a, a kind of university music developed. A lot of film composers use 12-tone uh, music when they want to, they have to write a lot of music in very little time, and if they want something that's gnarly and chromatic, it's the way to go. It's great. It solves every problem. It was a very entrenched music world, a music world that uh, believed that it knew what the future of music was. It believed the future of music was actually wonderful composers. Uh, it wasn't uh, that the music wasn't wonderful, it's just that there was only one kind of it. <laughs> 
And uh, my generation of composers decided we wanted to start somewhere else. Steve Reich, Philip Glass, Terry Riley, Lamont Young, they decided they were going to make a different kind of music. They were going to make this music which was simple, which was based on patterns you could actually hear. So much of 20th century classical music really abnegated the pleasure principle. And I think actually that was part of the reason for the huge success of minimalism when it came on the scene in the 70s. It was, it was like, wow, the pleasure principle's back. I think this first, first time I heard minimalism, it was in relationship to the art world, visual art world. The critics were latching on to the repetition angle of minimalism as being the main core of the technique. I think that, that was, that's the first element of, of minimalism. But I also th think that it has something to do with when you restrict the parameters of music to certain ideas. This is also part of minimalism where you have a stasis, you have a static uh, kind of form that isn't necessarily going anywhere but just sitting there and slowly things are changing within it. Minimalism was about music that was easy enough to hear and understand. You could hear the process of change. The era of the 60s and early 70s was a kind of renaissance in music. You know, the reason being is that the people in what I would consider my circle are colleagues of, of contemporary music, and people in rock musicians and jazz musicians were all kind of trying to do the same thing and the boundaries between pop music and classical music and jazz started dissolving a bit. It was a, a period of real discovery for a lot of people who were involved in the music field. And I was listening to everything that the Beatles and the Stones and the Beach Boys and the Who and every other group. At that time I was listening to everything that was coming out. I'm sure they were listening to a lot of my releases. But as I said, it was a, it was kind of a rare period where, where this was allowed to happen. And it's the way it should be, really. I mean, should, ultimately there's only music, you know. This repetitive music that we hear now seems to me to be a rather disturbing idea because we are faced in our lives continuously with repetition. And this is a destruction of the mind. And I feel that there's something element of that in, in minimalism. You're not meant to pay attention. But I think minimalist, as for lack of a better term, as a general movement in composition, has produced some very good pieces. What I was very fortunate in doing was to take a, a very specific language which had very narrow applications and I gradually expanded it. I do have a predilection for, uh, for a slow change and repetition. When I was young, I didn't expect people to like the music. I mean, I had an audience, but I didn't expect the uh, established musical world to like it. Some of the composers who were originally strong minimalists have kind of opened up their style, though it's not quite as severe as it used to be. Composers such as John Adams, who came along and essentially in the later 70s began to amalgamate minimalism with the new romanticism, was such an important figure. But both of those movements uh, were about making music that people could relate to. The borderline of what kind of music will be blurred. So what is pop, what is folk, what is classical, what is rock? 
and all this would be blurred because people are already doing all kind of blending. And there will only be two kinds of music, good music and bad music. It's like a recipe to me, uh, cooking in the sound kitchen. Huh? <laughs> I'll get my ingredients in together and then pour some sound in there and then out comes the music. <laughs> it was around 1970 that I started creating a system that I use, which is called the Expanded Instrument System, which is a series of processing that is it's recording sound and delaying it and uh, when the delay comes back, it may be modified. One wave pushed against another. So the shape of the wave that's modulating causes the changes that you're hearing, the fluctuations that you're hearing. So what I played was picked up by the system, recorded and, and delayed, and there, it's not only one delay, it's multiple delays. And I call it my time machine because I'm playing in the present. I'll play something, but I know it's going to come back uh, in the future. But when it does come back, it's part of the past. Sometimes I use uh, conventional notation also. So, I mean, you know, I'm very slippery. <laughs> My first interest in music was an interest in contemporary music. When I went to Harvard, the music department hated modern music and I couldn't understand why. So that was what was interesting me most as a very young person. I've never really gotten over it. to me there was a, a, a rhythmic world that had not yet been very much explored. I got a Guggenheim Fellowship and went out to Tucson and wrote that, that a big string quartet that lasts for 40 or so minutes. It's in many ways the most difficult of the pieces I've written. It's very hard to play. And I thought nobody would ever play it, but I like writing it. <laughs> I had realized from the earliest part of contemporary music, and that is that there was a way of isolating different ideas with different kinds of intervals. I began to feel that I could develop out of this idea of isolated intervals a, a harmonic scheme. I had recorded a uh, black Pentecostal preacher preaching about Noah. This is in 1964, a couple of years after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the idea of the end of the world was uh, very meaningful uh, and, and rather frightening in those days. And he's, one of his phrases was, it's going to rain. And at the same time as he said it, a pigeon took off. So I made a loop of him saying this. So you get this, it's going to rain, it's going to rain. So the pigeon became a drummer. <laughs> and beneath him on this loop and the pigeon with the drums was this kind of low roar of the traffic. So it was a very interesting, very rich tape loop. And I thought, well, what if there were two of them and they were in the relationship of it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to rain, rain. In other words, they were 180 degrees apart. So you'd have like this counterpoint, which in musical terms would be sort of like half the distance of dum ba da dee. So you'd have dum ba da dum ba da dum ba da dum ba da dee 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 dee. And so I thought, okay, good. Let's let's see if we can do this. So I put on a pair of headphones that had a, a jack in each tape recorder, and I, I started them up, and by complete chance. They were in unison. And it's funny, it sounded like the sound was in the middle of my head, uh, which is actually what happens when, 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 when things are lined up. It's this acoustical reality. And suddenly the sound seemed to move to my left, which 
really meant that the machine on my left was going just ever so faster, or the loop I had made was just a fraction shorter, or a combination of those things, who knows. Anyway, the, the, the sensation I had was that the sound was moving down my shoulder, <laughs> and then out across the room, and then I heard this kind of reverberation, and then I heard these kind of irrational contrapuntal relationships between these tapes as they move further and further apart until finally I heard it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to rain, 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 and then it begun, it, the process continued, and then I waited a little bit longer, and finally they were back in unison. And I was just riveted to this chance discovery. And I realized, I thought, well, this journey, this process is more interesting than that one single relationship. I had this feeling, oh, this is a great process, I just want to use this again. And the other feeling that, well, you know, this is a machine process. It happens with windshield wipers on a bus. It happens with uh, railroad crossing bells going in and out of face. But people can't do this. And I made a recording of a, of a pattern that eventually became the basis of a piece called Piano Phase. And I sat down at the piano with this loop playing and started with the loop. And then very slowly as I could, got one sixteenth note ahead. And I thought, wow. I can do it, and doing it feels good. We both start in unison, and one person gets just ever so slowly faster than the other until they're one beat ahead. Uh, when do they go and make the next move? Well, they go when they feel this is enough of this, we're, we have a good ensemble, and now I'm going to get a little bit faster and go ahead. Uh, if I had written out, well, exactly so many repeats, it would have added, uh, I wanted their minds to be on listening and not counting. In eight lines, there were the two pianos were playing basically a very short repeating pattern, and the strings were playing very sort of slow motion at lines that were much longer. So you'd have 10 repeats of the pianos to equal one phrase in the strings. I thought, well, what if I could just take that piano uh, pattern, which was very intricate and had lots of melodic, sub-melodic patterns buried inside of it, and string those out to make this flute melody, which will really be different combinations of pre-existing notes in the piano. Every, every note there is actually there already, but you never hear them that way until the flute spelled, hey, listen, listen to it this way. defined what minimalism was, although we didn't use that term in those days. When I thought of the idea of NC, it, it was really a kind of epiphany because, you know, here it could all be written on, on one page, and uh, it didn't have to be structured. It, was, it would be free, it would give everybody the chance to participate in the creation of the form. It was very democratic, and yet it would, re and it was made out of very simple uh, melodic fragments, but it would result in a very complex uh, listening experience. One of the processes is that you, everybody repeats each pattern, but they're free to repeat it as many times as they want. But the other idea is that as they progress from pattern one to pattern 53, they're supposed to stay together in a kind of group. Yeah, so they kind of have to listen as a group to each other to see how the group is progressing through the piece. And it's, it's kind of like the experience of playing in a James Brown band or something because you get these really strong grooving patterns together. And when they're really happening, it, feel, it feels very swinging and it feels very exciting kinetically. experience of playing intervals really in tune was one of the most powerful things I'd, I'd, I'd had experienced in music. You know, the, it's, it's funny how you take away all the kind of musical gymnastics and you just get resonating musical intervals that are really in tune and you've got the whole universe explained to you, like in, so in sound. <laughs> As a composer, you are a 
a machine, actually. A feeling machine. A machine deal with the feelings, memories, and, f and, 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 and passions. And no matter how genius you are, everything depends on what kind of sensitive machine you are. So train yourself, be very, very passionate. It's really very difficult to try to make things clear in music because music is very difficult to understand. It is the most difficult art form. Uh, because it progresses in time, and there are no words. Uh, so we don't have the logic of words to put together to have meaning, which, which gives us a linear feeling. Uh, and even looking at an abstract painting, your eye can go back and forward and see the, the end of the painting and the beginning of the painting, and then begin to put it all together. In music, it is moving at a speed, and you must hear it, remember what you heard, add it to what you're going to hear, and that becomes the piece. That's very hard to do for anybody. Um, I liken this sometimes to what would happen if you took Guernica of Picasso, and it's what, 12 feet long or whatever it is, it's a huge thing, and you put it on two rollers, and only eight inches of it was visible. And you took 25 minutes and you unrolled that picture before someone. Do you think they would appreciate it? Could they remember the horse, the arm, and then take that down to the mouth open and all of these things and put that all together? Probably not. That's what we have to do in music. As a composer, when you're starting out, you're involved with all kinds of music, and you're bound to be affected by some of it. I welcome kind of a stylistic anarchy where all, uh, all things can exist. My introduction that really made me want to become a composer eventually was a combination of Stravinsky, Bach, and Bebop. And, and in a sense, I opened that door, went into that room, and I'm, I'm still there. The improvisation is brilliant in jazz, obviously, and it's the heart of the music in many senses, but it wasn't just really that that drew me to me, it was the feeling of the time. Uh, a drummer like Kenny Clark was not a, not a virtuoso the way, let's say, Max Roach, his contemporary was, who could play a lot of things. He basically just kept time on his cymbal and threw in these bass drum accents, but the quality of that time was magical. It was like you were floating, literally floating. <laughs> And that quality of time, that quality of, of a regular beat, which was buoyant, moving forward, uh, effortless, was something that made a huge impression on me and which I've tried to convey in a totally different way. But I do remember hearing the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, which would have been, I believe, when I was about six. Um, and that was a, really a, a new revelatory world that was opened up to me. I'd already been listening to rock and roll and very, was very interested in this kind of early little Richard and Chuck Berry. I think my folks decided that it might be nice for me to hear some other kind of music. And so we went to the store and I remember they brought out probably three or four different Prokofiev recordings. But then they had the Scythian Suite, which is an early, extremely barbaric piece of Prokofiev. And here was this raw, savage music that absolutely just went right straight down to the deepest part of me. And so I said, this one, this is the one I want. That was really the beginning of this new facet of, of my love for music and I think that 
uh, as much as the Beethoven made me decide that I wanted to be a composer. I knew that already by the time I was seven. I became a composer before I was interested in being a musician. I didn't know anything about music. I came from a family that had no interest in music. On a rainy day in my elementary school, when I was nine years old, we couldn't go out and play in the yard. They put on uh, Leonard Bernstein, a film of a Leonard Bernstein young person's concert with Shostakovich's first symphony. Because in these days of musical experimentation, with new fads chasing each other in and out of the concert halls, a composer like Shostakovich can be easily put down. After all, he's basically a traditional Russian composer, a true son of Tchaikovsky. And no matter how modern he ever gets, he never loses that tradition. Bernstein explained that Shostakovich wrote this piece at the age of 19 and became world famous overnight. And I remember as a nine-year-old thinking, oh, I have 10 years, I could do that. besieged by sound, the world is full of sound, there are always airplanes overhead, subways underneath and in the cities. Uh, it's hard to find much quiet in the world and uh, maybe that could be a contribution of music to induce the sense of what real silence, at least relative silence, is. And I remember once David Sarabin says, George, you know, your music is getting more and more difficult just to hear in this world because of all the peripheral noises. And I do write, uh, you know, extreme pianissimo at times. But I think the world needs uh, maybe a little more pianissimo generally. <laughs> Of course I write for an audience, but I don't necessarily write what the audience wants, but I think that every, there's no composer that will tell you, that will say the hell with the audience. That music could be written without any possible idea that other people might be on the receiving end is, a, is an alien concept for me. But the audience authenticates me as a composer. Without the audience, I don't know uh, what the purpose of the music would be. This is not a common view, by the way. You'll find other people say, oh, they don't care about the audience. Well, I don't care. I mean, I write what I want, and I feel if, if people don't like it, well, that's too bad for me and too bad for them. That's all you can say. Sometimes audience members express guilt because they couldn't f analyze uh, or understand what I was doing uh, on, a, on a technical level. Well, they shouldn't have to. That the music should speak directly to people and they don't need technical knowledge of any kind to get the full impact of the sound if their ears are simply open to the music. The point is that if they somehow feel that the piece made sense, uh, that the, the logic of the work uh, help them understand the expressive message or meaning of the piece. That's what's really important. I send my stuff out into the world and anybody who, who wants it is welcome to it and anyone who wants to use it in any way they like are welcome to do it. That's another thing. I don't have any notion of a correct way of hearing or receiving my work. That's for the individual to decide. There's a myth floating around, which is partially true, that classical music is failing, that it's going down, the audiences are going down. But I'm not so sure it's happening with the, the phenomenal amount of chamber groups that are going on. There is a certain flexibility and leanness about the string quartet as an art form that I, I think composers do find uh, exciting. And um, so the intimacy of its history, I mean, if you think of American music, Charles Ives and, and um, Elliot Carter and Terry Riley and George Crumb, a lot of the people that, that we've worked very, very closely with, there is a body of music that is 
fantastically intimate and, and at the same time really expansive. I respect players' instincts, especially string quartet players on this level. They've got fantastic instincts. So sometimes my perspective might be a little off, and theirs might be right on. And they actually contributed some ideas. It went like that the whole way. And pretty soon they got more aggressive. At first they were like not showing any opinion. And I was like encouraging them, so what do you think? And they're like, after a while I was like, great idea, that's a great idea. What we would do, because the octave part is what's out of tune, correct? For me to come in and, and cut out a section, or for them to say, I think these triplets could go on a little longer, that's changing the page for them. The page had to come alive for them. I knew that. I knew that as a performer. If the page didn't come alive to them, I knew I hadn't accomplished what I wanted to do. So I want to soak myself as much as possible, you know, in the presence of the composers and for them to be really, you know, come on, g give me everything you're thinking so that I can then have as much knowledge, as much information, as much experience as possible. Whatever piece you're playing at the time, you have to think that that's the greatest piece of music on the planet. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and with that type of mindset, and as someone who is basically reliant on living composers, and 99.9% .9 of my work is based on new pieces of music, I have to commit myself to that piece of music. And an audience really does feel that commitment. And this is the beauty of a live performing situation. You know, they can feel the journey of a piece of music. They can feel the journey of that musician developing with the piece. seen such an explosion all over the country of composers, and young composers, young performers, um, wanting to write for the symphonic world. It's really amazing considering the fact that it's not in the best of health, the symphonic world, but there are tons of composers. I can't recall a time when more wonderful new pieces have been written in such a short time. Each new project represents some different aspect of living. The, the good, the bad, the ugly. Tuba, third of 77. Where were the two? Three. The happy, the sad. Uh, can that really be gross? Really, you know, like a real herb. Great. The, the profound and the silly. Uh, all of that's part of living. Exciting, and it is exciting, and it's it's also very scary. It's an adventure that's happening now. You can talk about it in words only so long, but finally, the music has to speak for itself. So I have this sort of 
premonition that 50 years from now, you, looking retrospectively, you would think this is perhaps the golden age of American music.